I will continue the course materials, yeah. And power one, maybe later we'll add, yeah, regarding the yeah the course materials for today. So as uh, we discussed it last meeting, yeah. So we have already learned regarding the using of the water supply system, yeah. So power one have explained uh, regarding several uh, operation units, yeah, like boilers, and also uh, explaining about the water treatment process, yeah and uh, other type for example for the falling scaling and corrosions yeah and yeah today i'll try to continue the course materials yeah regarding the uh, cooling water system yeah okay so i will share the slide first wait a minute Okay. okay, hopefully the slide uh, already appeared yeah, in your screen. So as I mentioned before that we will continue the materials regarding the cooling water system. Yeah. So uh, what's actually the cooling water system? Yeah, so in the previous study, we have already learned yeah, uh, regarding the, yeah, uh, uh, water system process, yeah, and the cooler, cooling water systems is actually could be done by using, we call it the heat exchangers, yeah. I think uh, all of you have already familiar, yeah, with, with, the, with the heat exchangers, yeah. I think you have already took or taken the course for the heat transfer, yeah. So heat exchanger, I think it's, it's familiar for you, yeah. And based on the heat exchanger system, so we, we can see that the heat exchangers is one of the example of, of the cooling water system. Yeah. Wait a minute. I will. I will. It is work already, but oh, wait. Yeah. I think my pen is not working well, so I will. Stop sharing first. Okay. Oops. Wait, 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 wait. It's weird. Wait a minute. Uh, hmm. One, do you know how to <laughs> how to make the Laser full pointer screen? and also oh, the... yeah, just right click and click full screen. Oh yeah, full screen. Okay. Yes. And, and then, then... Uh, it oh, should yeah, be yeah. on okay. the left. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But <laughs> it works now. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, go back again to the course materials. Yeah. So the heat exchangers, uh, as I mentioned before, is actually one of the examples. Yeah. Of the cooling water system. Yeah. So uh, wait, I will turn off the camera. Please. Okay, so the types uh, and features of the heat exchangers, we can see that it classified into three different types. Yeah, we know that the type of the exchangers consists of uh, the first one is fixed tube sheet, and we have also the floating head, eh? and also we have the U tube. Yeah, I think uh, you already familiar with these three types. Yeah, because I think you have already make a heat exchanger design yeah? as your final projects for the heat transfer courses. Yeah, hopefully you still remember about this. And uh, this is actually several features that uh, provided by using each type of the heat exchangers. Yeah, if we use the fixed tube sheet, yeah. So the fixed tube sheet is uh, actually easy to manufacture and also the price is actually uh, cheaper compared with others uh, types, yeah. However, uh, the fixed tube sheet, uh, uh, give the disadvantages yeah so it's it is actually difficult to clean uh, the shell side due to the impossibility of removing removing the 
tube bundle. So because yeah, the 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 position is actually fixed. Yeah, so it's very hard to it's very hard to uh, do kind of the cleaning or, or the maintenance process, especially for the shell side. Yeah. And the second and third type for the floating head and U tubes. Yeah. So the floating head is actually applied to cases of large difference in temperature between the tube and shell side fluids. Yeah. And in thermal expansions coefficients between the tube and shell materials. Yeah. And another advantage is yeah, it's, it is possible to clean the shell. Yeah. Because we can actually remove the tube bundles. Yeah. In in floating head and U tube types of heat exchanges. However. If we're comparing the, the price, yeah, of course, the floating head and YouTube is uh, more expensive compared with the fixed tube ship. Yeah, so we have to consider these two uh, uh, two parameters. Yeah, the first one is regarding the yeah, economic perspective, and the second one is regarding the yeah the, the performance and also the uh, ease of the maintenance. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, going to the next table here yeah? so we can see that from the table 3.3 we can see that uh, there are uh, characteristic yeah? of, of the tube side and shell side yeah so if we still remember regarding the heat exchanges yeah so it uh, actually classified yeah uh, one of the main main type is actually shell and tubes yeah the 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 so the, the famous yeah, the famous type is actually the shell and tube heat, heat, exchange, heat exchanges. So this is actually the the uh, uh, illustrations of the shell and tube sites. Yeah. So the characteristic for the tube side is uh, easy to get good effects of cooling water treatment because the flow rate is uh, usually more than zero point five meter per second. So yeah? while for the shell side, likely to cause the falling problems. Yeah. Due to the sludge accumulations because of the low and complicated water flow. Yeah. Okay, so on the right hand side is uh, one of the uh, examples of the heat exchanges. Yeah, so we can see it is actually very, very big. Yeah, so if we can imagine uh, in industrial scale, yeah, so you can see that this is the real heat exchanges that, that commonly used in, in uh, large scale applications. Yeah. Okay, so going to the cooling water system, yeah. So uh, this is the uh, the most important facility, yeah, to to control the process temperature, especially. Okay, uh, the functions or the the purpose of using the cooling water system is actually there are two main purposes or functions. The first one is to uh, take or remove heat from the process streams, and the second one is to remove heat. To the environment, or to release, yeah, to release heat eventually to the environment, yeah. And as we know that uh, we have, you have already learned regarding how, uh, what is the difference, and that there are also several characteristic or the main characteristic for uh, type of the water, yeah. So you have learned regarding the boiler feed water, yeah, and also we have yeah another one for today's course material is regarding the cooling water, so. Just want to ask you one question. Uh, what is the difference between the cooling water yeah, and boiler feed water? Anyone knows? What is the main difference? The composition, sir. Okay, the composition of what? Of the water, sir. Because okay. yeah, boiler water needs to be more specific, sir. Okay, more specific and more what, more pure, yeah, <laughs> usually. Or, or yeah, the, the characteristic uh, regarding the parameters, yeah. So you have to, we have to consider about the uh, critical parameters, yeah. So we have a critical parameters that need to be can consider for uh, boiler feed water, yeah, and also for the yeah, and also for the cooling water system. Okay. Critical parameters. Yeah. Okay, but what is actually the main uh, purposes, yeah? Or what is the boiler feed water uh, uses, and what is the cooling water system uses for? Anyone knows? Yeah, it's actually written in here. Yeah, so the function is for this for the cooling water system, but it's actually to dissipate large amount of heat. Yeah, but for the boiler feed water is for what? What is BFW used for? It is used for
used for energy for the plants sir. Yes, it's electricity generation. It's good, Kevin. Yeah. So it is actually for the electricity generations in power stations. Yeah, usually, yeah. Electricity generations in power stations yeah, or power plants. Okay. So uh, based on this, so uh, we have to consider also the specific requirements yeah, for for both applications. Uh, for sure, it, it will actually difference yeah, the, the 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 characteristic of the waters for for these two applications. Yeah, so that's why the critical parameters need to be monitored. Yeah, through the yeah maybe regular uh, laboratory tests. Yeah, and and or maybe continuous. Uh, online yeah to ensure that uh, the yeah the, the the characteristic of the water is actually fulfill the requirements yeah so what is the the critical parameters that need to be monitored or, or considered yes based on our previous meeting yeah? so what is the critical parameters that need to be monitored anyone The hardness of the water. Alkalinity, sir. Okay, good. Hardness. Yeah, we have hardness. We have alkalinity. And then others. pH, yeah. There's. What is the O content? Dissolved oxygen content, yeah. And maybe the last one is turbidity. Yeah. Okay, so these uh, five main parameters, yeah, commonly used, yeah. Or maybe we have also another one is conductivity. Yeah. Or yeah, we have also maybe minerals, yeah, to make sure that yeah, for example, so we have to calculate also the the contents, yeah, the contents of uh, phosphates, yeah, or or sodium, silica, and so on, chlorides, ammonium, yeah. Uh, yeah, we need to we need to consider about yeah several critical parameters to ensure the quality of the water fulfill the uh, characteristics for each applications yeah either for uh, boil for boiler feed water or for cooling water systems. Okay, so we go back to heat transfer basics yeah. So uh, <coughs> we have the in here we have actually two main uh, concepts that need to be uh, reminded yeah so hopefully you still remember so the first one is regarding the heat duty yeah so the heat duty is uh, determined by mass flow rate uh, and also based on the average heat capacity and temperature uh, changing yeah require or temperature decrease required for the process stream and also uh, we consider also the latent specific heat or or uh, uh, Symbol as it's as the alpha, yeah. Okay, so we have the Q or the heat duty is actually equals to MCP delta T plus M times the latent heat, yeah. And we have also another uh, term that need to be considered because uh, the second one is the rate the rate of heat transfer. Yeah? So the heat transfer system is determined by the overall heat transfer coefficients, yeah, or or we call it SU, yeah, and heat transfer area yeah the cross sectional area and also the the uh, average logarithmic delta uh, temperature yeah or we call it delta t lmpd yeah okay so we go back again what is delta t lmpd just want to test you yeah so if you cannot answer this question that you need to repeat the <laughs> heat transfer courses so what is delta t lmpd logarithmic 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 what Logarithmic mean temperature difference. Okay, so what does it means? Okay, logarithmic mean temperature difference. So what does it means? The formula, sir. <laughs> you know, the what is LMTD? Delta to LMTD means. So I know it's uh, the, the abbreviation is, is logarithmic mean temperature difference, yeah. But what does it mean? Is it the difference between the average of the cold and the hot uh, fluid, sir? Mm -hmm. The average of temperature? 
Ah uh, yes. Okay, the average of temperature. Okay. So any other thought from the students? Uh, it's like the ratio of the difference in temperature of inlet and outlet to the logarithmic of the in yeah the inlet and the outlet. <laughs> okay, the ratio of the difference of difference between the sorry in inlet and outlet yeah. temperature yeah it's actually the the formula yeah if you if you define it as uh, yeah that that statement yeah Kevin but it's is is yeah it's it's good yeah or any other thoughts yeah we call it usually the, the delta T L M T D is to uh, determine the temperature driving force yeah for heat transfer in flow systems yeah uh, yeah most notably in heat exchanges yeah. So yeah, uh, we call it that one is average of temperature difference between the hot and cold stream, yeah, at each end of the heat exchanges. But you have to be careful in here, yeah. So I just want to flashback, yeah, to to heat transfer courses, yeah. That in this case we have to consider also the we call it the flow, yeah, the flow of the fluids. Yeah. So we have uh, I think two characteristic, yeah. We have the cold current or we call it the parallel flow. And we have also the counter current. Okay. So what will be the difference in calculating the delta T L M T D for the co-current and also counter current flow? So if I have the shell and tubes, okay, go ahead, Kevin. The value will be different since the inlet of the shell and the tube will be varied from co current and counter uh, current. Since in co current, if I'm not mistaken, they travel mm -hmm. at the same direction. Mm -hmm. While mm -hmm. counter current, they travel in different directions. So yeah. the final temperatures will be different. Okay. So if, we, if I have in here, yeah, so I have the, so this is for the co current, yeah. We have the, for example, inlet streams, yeah, for the hot fluids, yeah. We have also in here hot fluid stream. Okay, so this is I should give an arrow, yeah. Okay, so I have the in here. I have T C in and T C out, yeah. Okay, so just want to remind you that for co-current or parallel flow, yeah. So the so yeah, maybe I'll write down the formula first, yeah. So delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by ln delta T1 divided by delta T2, yeah, or delta T ln T2, yeah. So delta T1 can be defined as, so which one is delta T1 and delta T2? Hmm. Based on the co-current flow, yeah. You know what? Forget already. Uh, both of the inlet temperatures, sir. Okay, both of the inlet temperature is for delta T1, yeah? So T H in minus T C in. And delta T2 is T H out minus T C out. Yeah. And for counter current, because the directions of the flow is different, yeah, as mentioned by Kevin. Then we have delta T1 is in. hot in minus cold in. Cold out. Cold out. <laughs> cold out, yeah. Yeah, should be cold out, yeah. Because the in is coming from the different directions. Yeah? And delta T2 is TH out minus TC in. Yeah? Okay, this is just, just for flashback, yeah. So hopefully you still remember for this. Okay, so uh, considering this, yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to uh, calculate yeah, the rate of the heat transfer based on yeah, these two type of the flows, yeah. And after you <coughs> calculated the delta T LMTD, you have to calculate also the cross-sectional area, yeah, or or the heat transfer area, and also you have to consider the 
uh, overall heat transfer coefficient ya yeah, where the overall heat transfer coefficients is actually based on the what is r in here resistivity sir yeah resistivity or resistance yeah okay so we have the uh, uh, as a functions of the total resistivity or total resistance yeah okay so uh, the heat transfer coefficients in consists of a number of components yeah and it is actually based on the yeah uh, total resistance uh, occurring in the materials yeah in this case uh, so we can consider several resistance yeah in based on this example so we have the inner fluid film resistance inner scale resistance pipe resistance outer scale resistance outer fluid film resistance and so on yeah and based on this, yeah, we have to consider also if you still remember, yeah, so we have to also consider whether the resistance is actually based on the convections, conductions, or radiations, yeah, because we will use the difference constant, yeah, to calculate the uh, therm thermal resistance network. Yeah? We call it usually thermal thermal resistance network. Yeah? If you still remember, yeah, in in, in heat transfer classes, yeah? so this. I, did, I will not explain in detail, yeah, but yeah, it's actually based on the resistance, yeah, the, the total resistance uh, occurring in the in the systems. Okay. Okay. So yeah, for the cooling water, it is actually classified into uh, two general systems. Yeah. So we call it the indirect cooling water system. Yeah. And direct cooling water system. So, uh, what is the difference between these two? Anyone knows or ever heard what is the indirect and direct means yeah, in cooling water system? Yeah, of course, no, yeah, because you didn't get the course yet. So, I will explain uh, what is actually the, the, the main difference. Yeah, so the main difference is actually for the for the in the indirect uh, cooling water systems, usually we have the uh, there is actually additional uh, cooling process yeah, fluid. Usually it's through heat exchanges. Yeah, so we have the yeah the the HA yeah, in here. Yeah, we have heat exchanges to uh, adjust yeah, adjust the temperature. Okay, while the direct cooling systems yeah, usually it is uh, directly directly transfer yeah the, the the water into the yeah into the internal pipeline in the in the process yeah so uh, the indirect cooling water system can be classified into three sub uh, classes yeah so the first one is open circulating cooling water system second one is closed recirculating cooling water system and the third one is once through cooling water system yeah while the direct cooling water systems can be classified into two, open recirculating and also once through cooling water system. Yeah. And I will explain uh, regarding uh, the these three classifications yeah, for the indirect cooling water system in the next slide. Okay, so for the indirect, so figure 3.1 .1, yeah, on the right hand side is uh, illustrated the typical water flow diagram yeah, in open recirculating cooling water system. So it can be seen that we have the evaporation loss. Yeah? We have also the windage loss. We have also the uh, blowdown yeah? here. Okay, so usually the quantities the quantities is uh, obtained by by yeah, through the calculations. Yeah, so we have we have to calculate how much uh, water loss. Yeah, so. Uh, affected by the evaporations affected by the wind yeah? and also during the blowdown uh, process yeah so in this system uh, cooling water is actually removes heat yeah uh, from the process fluids yeah by by uh, passing through the heat exchanges so we have in here yeah heat exchanges and the temperature will be uh, increase yeah? or rise yeah once we actually move to here yeah to the return water okay and the hot water uh, produced from the heat exchanges will be cooled in the cooling tower yeah in here yeah. 
by yeah by the partial evaporations yeah and also release of the latent heat of evaporations yeah. therefore the water is actually reused yeah, can be reused and also recirculated yeah by using the circulating pump okay so uh, the system is actually uh, uh, commonly used in in refrigerants yeah or to cool the products yeah and so on yeah and, and yeah, some of the petroleum refineries also using this uh, types of the classifications yeah? using indirect cooling water system uh, yeah, for the open recirculating system. And yeah, this is the general characteristics. Yeah, so the delta temperature of the cooling water uh, have an average of this temperature, while the makeup yeah, there is actually a makeup water yeah in here yeah? because to to balance the water loss, yeah. So the water loss will be obtained in this process, yeah. Due to yeah, evaporations, windage also blow down of the water, yeah. So that's why we have also a makeup water, but the quantity of the makeup water is actually moderate, yeah. It's not, uh, yeah. Uh, the the quantity is moderate in this in this uh, type of the indirect cooling water system. However, we have also general issues, yeah. Uh, while using the open recirculating system, so it, it is possible to uh, exhibit the corrosions, yeah, scaling, falling, yeah, weathering of the wood components and microbial activity, yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned before, that the heat from the process is removed, yeah, through the evaporations of the cooling water, and this is the uh, several types of the effect why the water can be loose yeah, in, in this uh, type of the indirect cooling water system. Yeah, it's due to the evaporations and due to the entrainment uh, carried away by the wind, yeah, or we call it the windage loss. And the third one is continuous blowdown to reduce accumulations of impurities. Yeah? So we need also to blow down the water in order to make sure that the, yeah, the characteristic and the quality of water is fulfilled the requirements. Yeah? Okay, so yeah, the water short, short edge is compensated by the continuous make up cooling water additions. Yeah, so uh, it is yeah, it is actually very important to make the balance yeah, between the water loss and also the water uh, input yeah, into the uh, this cooling open recirculating system. Okay, the next uh, subclassifications of the indirect cooling water systems. Uh, the second one we call it the closed recirculating system. Yeah. So, what is the main difference based on the flow diagrams that is presented in this slide? Anyone can guess or anyone have an idea based on the flow diagrams? The open one is exposed to air, sir. Well, this one isn't. Okay, exposed to air. Okay, good point. Any other thoughts? Uh, no blowdown as well, sir. No blowdown. Okay. What is the main? Yeah, there's actually one main difference in here. By by taking a look through the flow diagrams. There is a. This yeah, secondary cooler yeah. So previously we only have the yeah uh, primary cooler or yeah uh, the uh, set of the heat exchangers yeah yeah. Okay, but for the closed recirculating system yeah we have the uh, secondary cooler. So what is the what is actually the functions of the secondary cooler yeah? It is actually two. To cool more, sir. <laughs> <laughs> to cool more, okay. Yeah, to reduce the temperature, of course. Yeah. So because from the heat exchanges, the primary cooler, yeah, is, yeah, it will it will actually give you kind of the hot water in here. Yeah. And uh, using a secondary cooler, yeah, it will produce the colder colder water. Yeah. Before it is actually going through to the uh, 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 cooling water. Cooling water tank, yeah, in here, yeah. Okay, so uh, so the the main 
uh, the main features also in, in the closed recirculating system is actually the water loss is usually very, very small yeah, compared with the open recirculating system yeah, because the, yeah, we know that the system is actually closed. Yeah, so, so the water loss is, is yeah, of course, will be smaller. Yeah. And also the concentrations of the dissolved solid uh, by, by the evaporations is uh, rarely occurs. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we, we still have also a makeup water in here, yeah, even though the, the water loss is actually uh, very, very small. That's why in the general characteristics, yeah, we have the, the quantity of the cooling water is very low, yeah, because uh, uh, to compensate the yeah, the fewer the fewer loss of the water, so yeah, we only need very low amount of the makeup water, yeah, to to proceed the uh, water, water circulations in, in this uh, closed recirculating system. Yeah. However, the general issues still uh, can be found here. Yeah? So in, in, in this uh, system, yeah, which is the corrosions and also the falling. Okay. And the last one, we have the ones through recirculating system. Yeah. So what is the, the main difference in here? Anyone have a thought? based on the flow diagrams. So does the liquid just go through it once and not over and over again, sir? Okay, so it's not over and over again, or there is no cycle. Yeah? There is no cycle or, or no, no recycle of the water. Yeah, so it's only, so we call it once through, it means that the water after being heated yeah, by the uh, heat exchanges in here, so it is actually directly discharged into a receiving stream yeah, without, without uh, recir recirculations. Okay. But what is actually the main disadvantage of, of this uh, process? What is the uh, main oh, consequence? Yeah? What is the main consequence is if only once through system? Efficiency, like Efficiency. the water is just consistently getting thrown out. Okay, so yeah, that's why in here the the quantity of the uh, uh, makeup makeup uh, cooling water is very high. Yeah, because we need to supply water continuously. Yeah, in order to proceed uh, the the yeah the the process. Yeah, uh, because there is no recirculations. Okay. Okay, so uh, another issues in here, yeah, still, yeah, same with the uh, another classifications. Yeah? So we still have a corrosions, we have a falling, yeah? and also there is a movement of microbial activity. Yeah, uh, maybe it will actually uh, occur also the bio falling, yeah? will, which will be explained later. Yeah. Okay, so this is the three types, yeah. So open recirculating system, closed recirculating system, and once through recirculating system. Okay. Okay, so move on to the designing of the cooling tower. Yeah. So uh, as we know that the cooling tower, yeah, is used to cool the hot water, yeah, for for the recycling process. Yeah. So the, the main concept in here is actually in the cooling water, in the cooling tower, yeah, the hot water contacts with the cold air. Yeah. So we have the airflow also yeah, in, in this system in order to cooling down the, the hot water produced from the uh, heat exchanges. Yeah. So as the result, the hot water is uh, cooled yeah, and by releasing the latent heat separation. Fe fe Flatten heat evaporations, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is the main components of the cooling tower, yeah. So the first one is yeah, we feel to increase the air and water contact, yeah, because this is actually very important. We have two different uh, type of the fluids, yeah. The first one is liquid fluids, and the second one is the gas fluids, yeah. Uh, so we have to make sure that the the contact between the air and water is efficient, yeah. So it can be made of wood or polymer in here, yeah. And also the cooled water is accommodated at the bottom of the tower, yeah. So after uh, it uh, goes through the cooling process, yeah, usually the water will be 
ya yeah, will be there is actually an outlet at the bottom here yeah, in here yeah, or in here. Okay, so at the bottom of the tower or we call it the sum. Yeah. So the advantages is the high cooling capacity due to the evaporations and also capable to give high temperature reductions. Yeah. And however, yeah, uh, the cooling tower have also the disadvantages. Yeah, the first one is ex exposure with the external air causes yeah, contaminations with dissolved solids, acidic gases, and microbes. And the second one is higher operational temperature leads to higher corrosion rate. Yeah, so the by increasing uh, higher temperature, it will uh, affect the corrosion rate. Yeah, become also increase. Yeah. So we need to prevent uh, also these uh, conditions. Yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, examples of the cooling tower design. Yeah, so the uh, mechanical drafts uh, here type includes the force. Yeah, we call it the force draft and also natural draft. Yeah. Okay, so also they are actually classified into counter flow. Yeah, and also we have also the uh, cross flow types. Yeah. So based on the schematic yeah, uh, presented in this slide, what is the main difference between these two? Anyone can guess? So take a look into the schematic yeah, and, and what is the, the main difference of this uh, two uh, type yeah, of the cooling tower design? Anyone can guess or can have uh, an idea what is the uh, main features yeah, for, for these two types of the cooling tower? Um, there are two power packings here in the cross flow. There are what? Sorry? Oh, there are two. Um, this one, tower packing? Yes. Okay. And then why we call it cross flow? The direction of air flows. Okay, the directions of air flow. What, uh, what is the directions? It's crossing. <laughs> <laughs> it's crossing, okay. So it's crossing the water, you mean? <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Okay, okay, yeah. It's a good point. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, any other thoughts? What is the difference with the counterflow type? Yeah. So it's, it's a good point, yeah? So they are... Two tower packing in here, uh, and also in 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 the contrapole type, we only have one big uh, tower packing. Okay, so how about uh, the other points? So we have also the flow. Yeah, so we have to uh, emphasize on the flow flow of the fluids. Yeah, both for the uh, uh, gas or in this case air. Yeah, air fluids and also the water fluids. So what is the main difference in here? So we have a spray nozzle also. Yeah. In, in, in this in order to make the the contact the contact between the water and also the air become more efficient yeah same with this as well yeah if we can see from the figures yeah so we can see that for the cross flow type we can see that the directions of the air is actually horizontally yeah horizontally and also we will actually contact yeah with the tower packing in here yeah so it will give you kind of the perpendicular perpendicular contacts maybe yeah. so or or apa ya kontaknya itu tegak lurus gitu ya dengan uh, between between the fluids gitu ya. so we call it the cross flow type yeah while for this we can see that the the air flow is actually started from this yeah because in here is actually cross pack yeah. so the air flow is started from this and it will counter the flow of the water yeah is actually going up yeah so even though the air outlet is actually similar yeah going to up yeah but the main features of the main difference between the counter and also cross yeah is actually regarding the the, the flow yeah. so the 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 counter flow one is uh, the direction is uh, uh, different directions yeah between the air and also the, the water yeah while for the cross flow yes yeah, is, is actually crossing yeah is <laughs> is crossing the or, or uh, yes, it's perpendicular with the water or, or crossing horizontally, yeah, and contacted with uh, the water uh, perpendicularly, okay? Okay, so the each type of, of this uh, cooling tower design, of course, have the advantages and disadvantages, yeah? So 
the most the most suitable uh, types can be actually selected. So it, it is actually depends on the conditions, yeah. Such as yeah, we need to consider also the tower capacity, yeah. The tower capacity, and also we have also the for example the installation area. Yeah? And yeah, other other uh, parameters, yeah. But these two parameters is actually the main parameters that commonly considered to design which type of the cooling tower that can be used, yeah, for for the systems, yeah, in in industrial scale. Okay, so uh, this is actually another example of the cooling tower design. Yeah, so uh, the left hand side is the typical small size cooling tower. It is actually a counter flow type. Yeah, so uh, this is one of the examples that used in Japan. Yeah, so the we call it the round contour counter flow type cooling towers. Yeah, so this is used in the small scale system. Yeah. And the right hand side is for the typical large size cooling tower, yeah, or the uh, we call it, yeah, we it is a cross flow type, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can see the, yeah, the, the, the system is actually, yeah, the same with the previous uh, illustrations, yeah. So we have the uh, tower packings, yeah, and also we have the, yeah, cooling tower basin, and we have also the flow of the air and water, we have also a fan in here, yeah, and yeah. It is yeah classified in these two uh, flows yeah counter and also the cross flow uh, types okay okay so going to the uh, move on to the next one is uh, to calculate the cooling tower yeah or the cooling tower calculations yeah so uh, in the cooling tower industry uh, usually the desired temperature is river as the cold water temperature, yeah, due to the fact that it is uh, cooler than the water entering the tower, yeah. So that's why in here we have uh, two two terminology that need to be considered or pay attention. Yeah, we call it the temperature approach, yeah, and also the range yeah, or the cooling range. Okay, sorry, I think my <laughs> my screen on the left hand side is not working yet. Yeah? Once I <laughs> touch with my pen yeah it's, it's yeah it's it's not working yeah so start it from here <laughs> so if i if i touch the left hand side it's not working yeah I, I touch it now in the left hand side it's not working so sorry for the inconvenience yeah if, if uh, there is actually the abstract line uh, uh, in in the slide okay so yeah uh, again yeah there is actually two terminology that need to be considered. The first one is temperature approach that can be calculated based on the difference between the temperature of the sump yeah, or, or the temperatures of the, this one, yeah, wet, we call it also the wet bulb temperature and also with the uh, cold water temperature. Yeah. So the, sorry, the difference between these two, yeah. So the, the, Difference between the cold water temperature and also the wet bulb temperature, we call it the approach, yeah, temperature approach. Okay, so uh, it's already stated in here. Yeah, while for the cooling range is actually the uh, temperature of the hot water to cooling tower, yeah, or the inlet in here, minus the temperature of the cold water temperature from the cooling tower or in and the outlet, yeah, the outlet from the cooling tower. Okay, so this is, we call it the cooling range. Okay, so uh, the cooling tower uh, manufacturers yeah, often use this approach as a benchmark yeah, for, for defining the, yeah, uh, defining the cooling tower performance. Yeah, yeah using, using this one as a, a benchmark, yeah, benchmark for, for cooling tower performance. Okay, okay so uh, a cooling tower with a smaller approach, yeah, with a smaller temperature approach is uh, classified as uh, yeah, thermally superior to a tower with a larger approach. Yeah? So the, the lower the temperature approach, the better the the better the cooling tower performance, yeah? but 
there's actually an, an ideal range of these temperature approaches in the interval of 7 until 15 degree Fahrenheit. Yeah. So you have to take note that the units yeah, of the temperatures using in use in this cooling tower calculations and also later for calculating the uh, saturations index and so on, we use the degree of Fahrenheit, yeah, not a degree Celsius or Kelvin. Okay. Okay, so uh, another indicator yeah, of the cooling tower efficiency, yeah, we call it the cooling range. Yeah. So, uh, but actually there is a common misconceptions in is, is actually the, yeah, the difference between the hot water temperature and cold water temperature. Yeah, so you can see in here. Yeah. So it is actually influenced by the cooling tower performance as well. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the range or, or the cooling range in, in this uh, cooling tower uh, uh, performance, it is actually influenced by several parameters, yeah? So in, in the cooling range, it is actually influenced by several critical parameters, yeah? The first one is uh, affected by the heat load, yeah? Tower size. And also the flow, yeah? the flow of the fluids, yeah? or in this case, the flow of the air. Yeah? So these three critical parameters is commonly affected the, the, the cooling range. Okay, so uh, the next point is regarding the evaporation rate. Yeah, usually is uh, about 1% of the circulation rate for each 10 degree Fahrenheit of water temperature reductions through the cooling tower. Yeah, so this is actually the we call it the uh, yeah the basis yeah the basis for for each ten degree Fahrenheit the evaporation rate is close to or approximately one percent yeah and the loss the loss due to the entrainment is is commonly uh, due to the spray pond induced draft tower and also force draft tower so this is actually the interval range yeah, of of the uh, percentage yeah. So the spray pond is from one to five percent. Induced draft tower is from zero point three until ten percent. While for the forced draft tower is zero point one until zero point three percent. Okay, so this is yeah the, the main concept of the cooling tower. Yeah, as I mentioned before, then we have the cooling tower. There is actually a blowdown process and also evaporation. Yeah, and there is a make up cooling water in order to yeah to balance the water loss. Yeah. And it is goes through the heat exchanges, and the hot uh, water is actually returned back to the cooling tower. So this is for the recirculation system, yeah, whether it's open and closed recirculations. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next one is we need also to calculate. We call it the cooling tower uh, concentration cycle. Yeah. So. Uh, it is actually due to the open cycle. So this, the dissolved solid in the circulated water increases relative to the make up water. Yeah? So the concentration cycle can be calculated from the ratio between the dissolved solid concentrations in blow down yeah? uh, and the concentrations in make up water. So if we have, or we, if we have a look through the flow diagrams in the right hand side, yeah? Then we have the simple, uh, yeah, simple uh, mass and energy balance. Yeah, so we have a makeup water will be equals to the blow down, uh, and also uh, E is actually the evaporated water. Yeah, where the yeah MU is makeup water uh, mass flow rate, and also E is evaporated water mass flow rate. Yeah, and B, uh, it is actually uh, the uh, other water loss. Yeah which can be affected by the blowdown process, entrainment yeah, from the wind edge and so on, and also the losses and other, other losses. Yeah. Okay. So this is the, yeah, the basic formula to uh, calculate the concentration cycle. Yeah. And the next one is the evaporation rate can be calculated by using this formula. Yeah. So where the E is abbreviated or corresponding to evaporation rate, uh, in GPM, while, while the RR in here is recirculation rate, yeah? and delta T is the temperature or cooling range yeah? in, in degree Fahrenheit, yeah? 
and F is actually the evaporation factor. Yeah, so the evaporation factors commonly influenced by the several parameters. Yeah, so the uh, yeah we call it the we have the uh, evaporating surface. Yeah, we have also the dryness of air. Uh, velocity of the wind, yeah, for example. Temperature of the fluids. And the last one is the concentrations uh, of evaporating substance, yeah. Okay, so these five uh, parameters is commonly affected the evaporation factor. Yeah. And lastly, the total cycle can be calculated using this. Yeah. Make up flow rate divided by the blow down flow rate. Yeah. So as we get from the generic formula, yeah, in the first uh, part in here. So MU is a uh, make up is make up water is equal to the evaporated water plus the blow down mass flow rate. Yeah. So we can actually, yeah. I use this formula to calculate the total cycle. Yeah. So this is actually from MU divided by B, where the MU is E plus B. Okay. So this is the another uh, the examples of how to uh, calculate yeah, the, the cooling tower example. So for examples, we have the induced draft type cooling tower, yeah, uh, with the force circulations. It is operated with the following parameters. Yeah, so we have the <coughs> circulating rate of uh, ten thousand GPM, and uh, with the cooling range of twenty degree Fahrenheit. Yeah, and blow down loss zero point three percent. Okay, and uh, we need to calculate the total concentration cycle of the cooling tower. Yeah. Okay, so first we need to uh, yeah calculate the in here, rate of the evaporations, yeah, or E in here, yeah. So, because we need, yeah, so total concentration cycle is based on the concentration cycle is actually equals to the M U divided by B or equals to the E plus B divided by B. So, we need to calculate the evaporations uh, rate of the evaporations and also rate of the blow down yeah so the rate of evaporations we can use the second formula yeah from the previous slide which is the uh, recirculation rate times the cooling range uh, times the evaporation factor divided by 1000 yeah and uh, we have yeah the the recirculation rate of 10,000 and we have the cooling range of 20 degree Fahrenheit yeah and we assume that the uh, the what evaporation factor is one yeah in this case and divided by 1,000 then we get 200 gpm and for the rate of the blowdown we can just calculate the blowdown loss yeah which is 0.3 percent so just multiply it with the circulation rate yeah so 0.3 percent times 10,000 so we get 30 uh, GPM. Yeah. So the cycle or the total concentration cycle of the uh, cooling tower can be calculated using this formula. Yeah. So 200 plus 30 divided by 30, then we will have 7.7. .7, yeah. So this means that the circulated water contains dissolved solid 7.7 .7 times concentrated then in make up water. Yeah. So this is actually the the main message yeah, of how uh, what is the uh, definitions of the cycles in here corresponding to yeah? so it corresponding to the dissolved <coughs> solid concentrations yeah compare it with the makeup water okay so uh, the next one is uh, regarding the cooling tower water balance yeah so uh, under uh, steady state conditions, yeah, we know that the amount of the dissolved solid, which is actually supplied into the system by the makeup water, 
is actually equivalent to the amount of the dissolved solids which are discharged from the system yeah, by water blow down or by, by the wind edge, yeah, uh, wind edge loss. So the cycle of the concentrations in here indicates the ratio of the dissolved solid concentrations. Yeah. So as, I, as from the previous example, we can see that yeah, it is actually indicating the dissolved solid concentrations in the circulating water yeah, to that uh, of the makeup water. And it's actually defined as this formula yeah, where the uh, N or the number of cycle is equals to the CR divided by CM, where the CR is dissolved solid concentrations in circulating water, yeah, while CM is the dissolved solid concentrations in make up water. Okay. Okay, so uh, from the figure 3.10, it is actually shown that a typical relationship yeah, between the cycle of the concentrations okay, and the make up water quantity, yeah. Uh, calculated by using the actually the equations yeah so the equations is based on this yeah so the makeup water quantity can be calculated using the uh, based on the uh, equations 3.9 yeah so as shown in the figure 3.10 we can see that the operations of the cooling water system at higher cycle of concentrations may cause deteriorations yeah, of the cooling water quality and various problems. Yeah? And we can see that by increasing the cycle of the concentrations, the blow down uh, water and also the makeup water yeah, for the water quantity uh, in the circulation rate is actually going down uh, exponentially. Yeah? And it actually saturated in the certain uh, uh, threshold yeah, in the certain numbers of the water quantity. Yeah? Okay, so thus, uh, usually for the yeah, water treatment chemicals have a certain limit of their effectiveness. Yeah? So an appropriate a cycle of the concentration is actually needed yeah, in here. So based on these uh, figures, so cooling water system are usually operated with the cycle concentrations in between three until five. Yeah? Because uh, above cycle concentrations of five, yeah? so it's actually it's, it is, it's going... Uh, a plateau yeah for the water quantity uh, in as a functions of the cycles of concentrations okay so i have a video in here regarding the common problems in cooling tower yeah please have a look in three minutes video uh, and we can discuss yeah what is the main message from the video enjoy uh, i think the the voice is not I didn't share the voice, the sound of the computer. So wait a minute. Includes eh, share sound. Okay. Cooling towers and circuits face numerous operational issues such as corrosion, scaling, bacterial growth, and fouling due to suspended solids. Corrosion shortens equipment life and may result in unexpected failures. Scale reduces heat transfer efficiency. Microbiological growth reduces heat transfer, can increase corrosion and can cause health risks. All these problems lead to system downtime and increase the total cost of operation for cooling towers. ATE now brings you a reliable and innovative solution, wall chem controllers, to mitigate these issues with the cooling towers. Wallchem controllers are a globally accepted solution, trusted by most water doctors to optimize chemical usage through accurate dosing, conserve treated water through right blowdown, minimize health risks and improve life of the cooling tower, heat exchangers and cooling circuits. The pH sensor monitors pH level on a real-time basis and maintains it within specified limits through dosing. The oxidation reduction potential, that is 
ORP sensor monitors free residual chlorine levels. This is then maintained by continuously dosing biocide to prevent bacteria and algae growth. The conductivity level of the cooling water is maintained by on-time and accurate blowdown control, bleeding off only the required amount of water from the system. The fluorometer sensor provides 4 to 20 milliampere signal output proportional to the concentration of the fluorophore being measured. The corrosion sensors measure the instantaneous corrosion rate and the pitting tendency in the conductive liquid by the electrochemical technique of linear polarization resistance, that is LPR. Wall chem controllers can be accessed anytime, anywhere through a web interface and users can get alerts by SMS, email or localized hooters. ATE's flow technology will help you monitor and control all system parameters 24 by 7 with on-screen graphs and web monitoring. Maintain and control critical water parameters that lead to corrosion, scaling and biofouling. Save water by precise control on cycle of concentration. Save energy by keeping the heat exchanging surface clean and clear from scale and fouling. ATE's localized service supports ensure that the systems are checked regularly and calibrated on time to ensure smooth operating of the system. ATE, an expert in liquid flow management with its All India network of service support ensures the systems are checked and calibrated on time for a smooth operation. Contact ATE Enterprises for all your liquid flow management requirements. Okay, uh, that's the video. Yeah? Sorry, I'm not actually the sales of the ATE technology. Yeah? So this is just one of the examples how to <coughs> define the several problems in, in the cooling tower. Yeah. So based on the video, so I'm just wondering what is actually the four main problems in cooling tower? Anyone can uh, explain? Corrosion, sir. Okay, corrosion. Scaling. Scaling. Three. Falling. Or my, oh. Falling. Okay. And the fourth. Bacterial growth, sir. Okay. Bacterial, or we call it microbial growth, yeah. Okay, so what is the consequence if we have the corrosion, scaling, falling, and microbial growth? What is the impact if we have the corrosion in the cooling tower? Based on the video, yeah? So I'm just <laughs> curious whether you pay attention to the video, even though it's just short three minutes video, yeah? Failure of the yeah the materials and the pipes. Yeah. Okay, unexpected failures or yeah short short term equipment life yeah short term equipment life which yeah which costs also the higher operating cost yeah later yeah to to maintain uh, the cooling tower. Okay, how about the scaling? What will be the consequence if we have a scaling in cooling tower? The cases heat transfer rate. Okay, reduce, yeah, reduce heat transfer efficiency. How about folly? And also, how about the microbial growth? It's the same, yeah, so it's reduce also heat transfer efficiency here for these two. Okay, so based on this, it will actually give an impact, yeah? So as mentioned in the video that if we have these uh, problems yeah, in our cooling tower, it will give you the yeah, high operating costs, yeah? 
for, for the maintenance especially and yeah increase cost of productions and also higher energy consumption so because the yeah, uh, the heat transfer efficiency is getting reduced yeah affecting by the several type of problems yeah scaling pulling microbial growth then how to mitigate this issue provided by the ATE technology. <laughs> so we can provide, we call it the controller in order to monitor uh, uh, real-time monitoring yeah, for several parameters. Yeah. So what is the parameters that can be detected or monitored to ensure that these problems can be mitigated? pH, sir. pH, and then conductivity, yeah. and then corrosions, corrosion sensor, yeah. we have also corrosion sensor in, in this technology, and so on. Yeah. So there are actually several uh, parameters that can be monitored real time and online yeah, to ensure that uh, the cooling tower uh, free from the problems yeah, or free from, from this uh, for a problem especially. Okay? And to ensure that the quality of the water also fulfill their uh, requirements. Okay, so yeah, this is the uh problems yeah in cooling tower as mentioned yeah, previously from the slide so we have the corrosions yeah and we have also scaling and also bio falling yeah due to the slim and sludge yeah and the uh, table below is actually uh classifications of the type of the problems based on the type of the cooling water system yeah so we have the ones through uh, uh type we have also closed recirculating type and also open recirculating type. Yeah, based on this table, we can see that the uh, closed recirculating type yeah give the uh, best uh, scaling and slime yeah or the, or the bio falling in this case because it will it it gives the lower scaling and also slime while it still give the higher corrosions yeah. Same with the open recirculating. Yeah, for the open recirculating, all of the uh, problems actually occurred. Yeah, in the higher frequency. Yeah, while for the once through, yeah, the corrosions, uh, the corrosions and slime is actually moderate. Yeah, while the scaling is actually lower. But the consequence for the once through is yeah, we need actually a very high uh, make up water. Yeah, for for the cooling water system. So this is the tabulations for uh, trouble in the cooling water system. Yeah. So corrosions in here is actually the main uh, main problems. Yeah. In all of the uh, troubles. Yeah. So we can see that in here corrosions, corrosions, corrosions. Yeah. Corrosions, and it will uh, affect it. Yeah. It's kind of the multiple effect. Yeah. If we have the corrosions in the cooling water. So the first one is shorten operation life of the heat exchangers and piping, reductions of heat exchangers, thermal efficiency, and increase of the pressure drop, yeah, and leakage of the products and contaminations of the products with cooling water, and also the absorption waste of water treatment chemicals. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so going to the corrosion mechanism, I think Power One also has already uh, explained yeah, regarding the corrosion mechanism. Uh, in the corrosion mechanism, we have <coughs> the uh, electrochemical reactions. Yeah? Well, uh, it is actually classified into two uh, uh, electrodes. We have the anodes and also cathodes, yeah? where in the anodes, it actually occurs the oxidation process where the iron uh, transform or, or uh, becomes the iron two plus and generate two electrons. Yeah? While on the cathodes is a reduction process and the oxygen is actually reduced yeah, by the presence of the water and also consuming the two electrons to generate the uh, hydroxide ions. Yeah? 
uh, and on the cover also uh, it's possible also to do the second reactions where the 2H plus yeah or if in the acidic uh, conditions the 2H plus will be converted to the hydrogen gas yeah by consuming two electrons. Okay, and the overall reactions, the Fe2 plus will react with the hydroxide ions to create the iron hydroxide, and the iron hydroxide will react with the oxygens and water to, to generate the iron three plus, yeah, or or this is yeah, iron oxide with uh, uh, iron oxide hydrate, so, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, another uh, conditions is when we can see that in here, yeah, when slime uh, or falling mainly composed of microorganisms, is actually there's also two metal surface, yeah, and produce anaerobic conditions under the falling, yeah, and in this case, sulfate reducing bacteria grow, yeah, and the cathodic reactions is actually proceeds, yeah, here, yeah, so where the sulfate will be react with the uh, H plus and also electron to create the hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, so the H2S in here also one of the compounds that is actually very corrosive. Yeah, and we need to prevent also this uh, generations of the hydrogen sulfide. Yeah? And falling, when falling materials such as corrosions products, slime and sludge uniformly adhere on carbon steel surface, a local anode is actually produced under the falling yeah, because the lower oxygen concentrations and surrounding areas with the higher oxygen concentrations become local cathodes. Thus, the carbon steel is attacked by local corrosions, or, or we call it the pitting corrosions yeah, under the falling. Okay, so that's why in here, in order to uh, mitigate these issues, yeah, we have actually several strategies to uh, that can be conducted. But before going to the mitigations, uh, this is actually the factors that is influence the degree of the rate of the corrosions. Yeah, so we have the oxygens first. Yeah, so why the oxygens can be actually the main problems in here? Because the yeah the we can see from the reactions. Yeah, if we have the oxygens, yeah, it will create the yeah the corrosive compounds. Yeah, which is actually the iron oxide hydrate. Yeah. Uh, so that's why the dissolved oxygen must be controlled here yeah, in, in the cooling water system. And also the pH here is very important. Yeah? So in, we can see from the cathodic reactions here, yeah, if, the, if the reactions actually occur in the acidic medium, yeah? so there's actually a possibility to perform the second reactions and also it will also promote this reaction as well yeah? because it's, it's in also acidic conditions to generate the uh, so hydrogen sulfide as uh, corrosive materials. And the dissolved solid also one of the main <coughs> causes. Yeah? So when the amount of dissolved uh, solids is in the recirculating cooling water reach uh, critical threshold. Yeah? So this mineral will precipitate yeah? out of the solutions and accumulate on the surface yeah? in the cooling water uh, materials or in the cooling water uh, system. Yeah? So in order to control, so what will be the idea to mitigate these issues? If we have the, a lot of precipitate in the cooling water system, what will be the, the mitigations based on the, yeah, based on the theory that we already learned from the previous slide? Anyone have an idea? I think it is actually uh, illustrated in most of the flow diagrams, yeah, in the open recirculated system, in the closed recirculated system. What it is mitigations? Started from B. L. One knows. Blow down, sir. Yes, blow down. Yeah, so that's why it, uh, the blowdown uh, process commonly employed, yeah? or, or we call it also the draw off, yeah? draw off or, or blow down is commonly employed in order to mitigate this issue, yeah, and also to control the build up of the minerals deposits yeah? in, in, in the cooling water system. 
So the next one is temperature. Okay? The temperature of the water also is very important. So in the increase of the temperatures will contribute to increase of the number of the active centers yeah, of the corrosions on the metal surface. And it will uh, promote or facilitates the accelerations of the development of the corrosion processes. Yeah? So yeah, it is necessary then to, to mitigate this issue as well. Yeah. And also the metal properties, yeah, the materials that is actually used in, in the <coughs> in the cooling water system also is very important. Okay. So the yeah, in here, internal treatment to avoid corrosions in cooling water system. Uh, we have uh, actually one of the common method is by adding the corrosion inhibitor, yeah, such as chromate base and also the uh, phosphate compounds, we can also use silicate, nitrate, and ferrocyanide and molybdate. Yeah. Okay, so the corrosion inhibitor in here, yeah, so uh, of the, uh, to, to prevent the corrosion process yeah, for cooling water system, commonly is actually water soluble, yeah, so it's uh, soluble in the, in the water. However, they will actually generate or form insoluble films on the metal surfaces yeah, in order to prevent the accelerations of the corrosion process. Yeah. And this film is commonly called protective films or an, and can inhibit the corrosion reactions yeah, by preventing the hydration of metal ions or reductions of dissolved oxygen on metal surfaces. Yeah. Because once the oxygen uh, is actually react yeah, with, with the metals, yeah, and it will perform the oxygen reduction reactions, and it will uh, generate the this yeah, the hydroxide ions. Yeah. Okay, so the functions of the protective film is uh, closely related to the effect of the corrosion inhibitors. Yeah, so the the films this actually uh, protective films that is generated yeah from the uh, corrosion inhibitors. It will uh, yeah give an effect to inhibit the corrosion process. Yeah. So this is several types of the corrosion inhibitor. Yeah. So we have the oxide film type. And we have the chromates, nitrates, molybdates, uh, compounds base. Yeah. Uh, we have also the chemical forming the insoluble salts with the calcium ions. We have uh, polyphosphates, yeah, the phosphate base, and also we have zinc salts. Chemical forming also insoluble salts with the protective metal ions. We have the uh, yeah thiazole, thiazole and triazole groups. Yeah. And the last one, we have also the amines and surfactants yeah, for the type of the absorption film type. And yeah, with a certain uh, characteristic yeah, of the protective film. Okay, so the parameters that affects the corrosion inhibitors, it is actually classified into this, uh, how many, five, yeah. We have calcium hardness, also pH, yeah. So we have to control the pH. Uh, the aggressive anion concentrations also is very important to monitor and the water temperature and also the flow rate. Yeah. So we have to uh, adjust yeah, the, the optimum conditions for these five parameters in order to prevent the corrosion process. Okay, so uh, other methods to prevent the corrosion here, yeah? uh, instead of we use the corrosion inhibitor, we can use also the cathodic protections lining and coating and use corrosion resistant materials. Yeah? So for the cathodic uh, protections, usually it uh, prevents the corrosion by converting. Yeah? So the idea is actually converting all of anodic sites, yeah? or we call it as an active sites yeah? on the metal surface. Sorry. On the metal surface to cathodic yeah, or to the passive side yeah. by supplying the electrical current yeah, or free electron. Yeah. Uh, while for the coating, yeah, uh, the coating will actually protect. Yeah. Of course, the, 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 the main aim of the coating is to protect metal surface from the degradation or, or from the oxidation process yeah, and also prevents the direct contact. Yeah from the uh, compounds, especially yeah, from the oxygens, and act as a barrier from the corrosive materials, yeah, and also provides the chemical protections yeah, and abrasion resistance yeah, using a coating. Okay, the last method is here, yeah, use corrosion resistance yeah, in order to prevent the corrosion process. Okay, I have uh, three minutes. 
uh, video again yeah for uh, illustrating the corrosion inhibitor processes yeah so please have a look through corrosion inhibitors in oil and gas pipelines pipelines are used in the industry to transport oil and gas products from the well to central processing plants or downstream locations, sometimes over long distances. During the transportation of oil and gas in pipelines, it's common that wells produce other products that are likely to cause corrosion, such as water and carbon dioxide. Long-term damage to pipelines can lead to oil spills. Corrosion inhibitors are chemical compounds that are added to a fluid to reduce the rate of corrosion in materials in contact with the fluid. For example, an inhibitor will be injected into the stream of hydrocarbon near the wellhead to reduce corrosion in the steel of the pipeline. But how does corrosion inhibitors work? They work by forming a protective film on the metal preventing corrosive elements contacting the metal surfaces. The main mechanisms for corrosion are caused by gas such as carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide or oxygen, and corrosion influenced by microorganisms. Factors affecting corrosion and corrosion inhibitors. Flow characteristics. In multi-phase flow, corrosion occurs on the top of the pipeline, also called as top of the line corrosion, TLC. It cannot be treated due to the lack of inhibitors on the top of pipe well. Temperature. Carbon dioxide corrosion rate. In the presence of water, corrosion is increased as temperature of the flowing creek or pipeline is increased until corrosion forms. And also pre-corrosion. Inhibitor performance are usually impaired after a long period of precaution scenario. This results in localized corrosion attacks. But how do we determine the effectiveness of inhibitors? We can use this inhibitor likelihood success score, RLSS, which is score based Four factors, which are operating temperature, shear stress, total dissolved solids, and predicted corrosion rate. A high score would mean that the specific chemical corrosion inhibition would be less effective unless high concentration is used. The table below shows the range of values of score and the effectiveness of the inhibitor. Wow, we have learned so much today. We now know that corrosion is a natural problem of material deterioration that will always exist, and corrosion must be reduced as much as possible by using inhibitors as to not bring great material loss or hinder production. Let's inhibit corrosion. Okay, so I think this is one of the good video for the assignments, yeah? So, as we see that this is actually the assignment yeah from from the UTP University Technology Petronas I guess yeah so one of the group assignments so they I think make the the, the video yeah regarding the corrosion inhibitor okay okay so based on the video what is actually the common compounds that can actually affect or that can uh, produce the corrosions CO2, what, what, sir. Okay, CO2. And then we have four, yeah, based on the video. Water, sir. Water. That. H2S, yeah. And the last one is microorganism, yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, several factors also need to be considered. Yeah, so there are three factors, which is flow characteristic, temperature, and pre corrosion, so the inhibitor performance. Yeah, and the uh, effectiveness of the inhibitors can be calculated using what, what is what it is called effectiveness of inhibitors. We call it ILSS, sir. Yeah, ILSS, yeah, which can be actually affected by the operating temperature, total dissolved solid, predicted corrosion rate, and shear stress, yeah? Okay, so hopefully you get the take-home message yeah, from, from the video. 
Okay, so going uh, move on to the next one is uh, regarding the scaling. Yeah, so the scaling uh, is a typical components of the scales can be found in the cooling water. So we have four uh, components. Yeah, we call it calcium carbonate, calcium and zinc phosphate, silica and magnesium silicates, and calcium sulfates. Yeah. So the scaling is usually commonly uh, generated due to the presence of the inorganic sediments. Yeah, one of them is calcium carbonate, mostly found in the cooling water. And the sedimentation rate will be increased along with the temperature. Yeah, and the tendency of water to form a scale or scaling yeah, is represented by this index. Yeah, so you have to know. So we call it the Lang Lang Langelier. If it's in Sundanese, <laughs> it's Langelier. Yeah. So this is what is known as Langelier saturation index. Yeah, LSI. Yeah, so the LSI has become the the what do you call it? This this the standard. Yeah, the standard to to represent the uh, scaling process. Yeah. So the F, if the LSI lower than one, so then the water tends to form the calcium carbonate sediments. Yeah. The scaling control can be done also by limiting the concentration cycle. Yeah. So as I mentioned previously, uh, by increasing the blowdown. Yeah. So the concentration cycles can be calculated by using the formula. Yeah. So the formula of the make up water. So based on the make up water uh, formula, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So if that causes the total cycle is too low, sulfuric acid solution is continuously added yeah, to decrease the water alkalinity. Yeah. So by adding the hydrogen sulfate in here or on the uh, uh, sulfuric acid, yeah. So it will generate the calcium sulfate. So where the calcium sulfate has higher solubility in water compared with the calcium carbonate. Yeah. So this is one of the way in order to uh, increase the total cycle. Yeah. Okay, water hardness and alkalinity. Uh, I think power one have already explained regarding this yeah, in detail, but in principles, yeah, the hot water is uh, water that has high mineral content yeah, uh, and uh, form when the water percolates through deposits uh, limestones. Yeah. And the hot water can pose critical problems in industrial applications and deposit of minerals from hot water can cause this year yeah, fallings and damage to boilers and cooling waters. Yeah. So that's why this uh, water hardness is usually yeah, one of the parameters, critical parameters that need to be monitored and, and considered yeah, in order to ma uh, maintain the boiler performance and also the cooling water efficiency. Okay. The alkalinity is water's capacity to neutralize acid, yeah, where the water body with high level of alkalinity has higher level of calcium carbonate, which can decrease the water's acidity. Yeah. So thus, the alkalinity measure how much acid can be added to a water before a large pH change occurs. Cool. So this is the classifications of uh, the hardness yeah, in, in uh, uh, several units. Yeah. Uh, we can see that in here, uh, in milligram per liter calcium carbonate, we have also in minimal per liter. What is this unit means? Anyone have known? DGH or degree of GH, what is what is this means? Anyone? Is it degrees of general hardness? Yes, good. Yeah. Degree of general hardness. It's not the Gibbs energy, yeah. <laughs> It's not the Gibbs energy times enthalpy, yeah. So it's it's difference, yeah. Degree of general hardness, yeah. So GH abbreviated to general hardness. Okay. And what is GPG? What is the GPG unit stands for? Grain per gallon, yeah. Or uh, it is actually uh, equals to around seventeen ppm, yeah. Okay, and ppm is yeah milligram per liter, yeah. So it's it is actually classified yeah for the hardness into four classification. We have soft, moderate, moderately hard, hard and very hard. So it depends on the range, yeah. There's actually a certain range in here, yeah, that can be classified into this uh, 
classifications for the water hardness. Okay, so the type of the hardness, uh, it actually classified into two. Yeah, we have temporary hardness and supermanent hardness. I think Pak Wawan also have explained regarding this. Yeah, so for the temporary hardness is caused by dissolved bicarbonate uh, minerals like uh, calcium and magnesium bicarbonate. Yeah, and the presence of the metal cation makes the water hard. And however, this hardness can be reduced either by boiling the water or by additions of lime. Yeah, the lime in here. Is actually calcium hydroxide eh? or CaOH, CaOH2, yeah, through the process of the lime softening. Yeah, so if the temporary hardness is occurred, so we can just uh, boil the water or add the lime or calcium hydroxide. Yeah, in here, boiling will promote formations of carbonate, yeah, from the bicarbonate and precipitates calcium carbonate out of solutions and leaving the water that is softer upon cooling. While for the permanent hardness, yeah, uh, are generally difficult to remove by boiling. So we have to think another strategy in order to prevent these uh, uh, problems. Yeah, uh, and this type of the hardness commonly caused by the calcium sulfate, calcium chloride, yeah, magnesium sulfate, and magnesium chloride in the water, which do not actually agglomerate or precipitate out as the temperature increase. Yeah? So if we just boiling the water, yeah, if the permanent hardness occurred, so it will not actually give a significant impact or mitigate these issues. Yeah? That's why in here we can use a water softener yeah? in order to uh, remove the permanent hardness or ion exchange column. Okay, so uh, we move on to the LSI calculations. Yeah? So what is LSI? Long layer, long layer saturation index. Yeah? So the LSI is long layer saturation index. So in order to know whether the whether the system is actually occurred or, or uh, uh, generate the scaling or not, yeah. So we can see in here the examples of the calculations of the LSI. Yeah. So as an example, uh, suppose the drinking water supplied to animals has the following analysis. Yeah. So the water is supplied at twenty five degrees C. Yeah. And also eighty two degrees C. Yeah. So you need to determine the scaling tendency at both conditions. Yeah. So how do we calculate it? So the LSI formula is actually based on the pH value. Yeah. So we have the pH A, or we call it usually pH A, yeah, or the actual pH yeah, uh, minus pH S. Yeah. So the pH S have a formula of this. Yeah. So this is the pH actual, yeah, 7.5 is the pH actual. So we have uh, in these conditions, we have the TDS, total dissolved solid of 320 ppm. We have calcium, 150 ppm, as calcium carbonate, yeah, and alkalinity, 34 ppm. Yeah. Based on this, we need to calculate first the pHs. Yeah. So how to calculate the pHs is depends on this uh, parameter, yeah, A, B, C, D where A is actually logarithmic of the total dissolved solid, minus one divided by 10. Yeah, So we have also the data or in here, 320 ppm. So you can just input the data and calculate it. We will get the A values, yeah, 0 0.15. While the B is actually, uh, this is the formula, yeah, minus 13.12 times logarithmic of the temperature in the degree C plus 273. So you need to uh, yeah you need to use the in, in Kelvin yeah in here yeah plus thirty four point fifty five so the only parameters the temperature yeah so in here the temperature is eighty two and twenty five yeah so we have two temperatures that need to be evaluated so for twenty five degrees C we have B values is two point zero nine while eighty two degrees C we have one point zero nine. And for the C is logarithmic of the calcium to pass as the calcium carbonate. Yeah, so this one, 150 ppm. This put a log 150 minus 0 0.4, then we will get uh, 1.78. Oh, sorry, my connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, okay. So the last one is D, which is actually log alkalinity as calcium carbonate. Yeah, so we have the alkalinity in here. Yeah. 
34 ppm. Yeah. So we will just input 34 in here. Log 34 is 1.553. Yeah. Okay, so we calculated the PHS. Yeah, then we will get 8.2 and 7.2 for 25 and 82 degrees C respectively. Then we can calculate the LSI. Yeah, equals to the pH actual actual pH yeah, minus PHS, which is 82 for 25 degree and 7.2 for uh, 82 degree. Okay, so based on this, we will have these values. Yeah, minus point 0 0.7 and plus 0. 3. Okay, so based on this, we can actually say that for the results of the minus value, then the no tendency to scale, while for the positive value, yeah, this is slightly tendency to scale. Yeah, so yeah, I will give you the tabulations later on yeah, in order to classify uh, the scaling. Yeah, okay, uh, beside we use the formula. We can use also this uh, chart here yeah, in order to calculate the uh, LSI or long layer saturations index. Yeah, so we can use the LSI chart. Uh, how do we actually use it? Yeah, so we can see that from here. For the y-axis, we have a ppm. Yeah, yeah, is the y-axis is similar. Yeah, the right hand side and uh, left hand side is similar. So it's in parts per million. Uh, and below side we will we have the p alkaline and also p ca or p calcium yeah and in the above side we have c scale yeah and also we have also the temperature here yeah and we have also the diagonal line indicated the to calculate uh, as a what do you call it as a barrier to calculate the pca letter yeah and for the this one is to calculate the p alkaline Okay, so this is yeah I think this chart is actually uh, created yeah during maybe from the experimental results yeah so the maybe yeah the name of the founder is Langelier, I believe yeah Langelier, yeah created this uh, chart in order to make the the calculations become more easy yeah or become the alternative uh, Calculations, yeah. Okay, so we can uh, try, yeah, for the calculations uh, from the previous example, yeah. So we can try, for example, uh, for the eighty-two degree C, yeah. Eighty-two degree C, we have the uh, pH. So I'll, I'll try to write it down. All of the known parameters first, yeah. Actual pH is seven point five. Sorry. EDS is 320 ppm calcium we have 150 ppm alkalinity we have 34 yeah 34 ppm okay uh, and then what we need to do is we need to calculate yeah there is actually the the methods or or the instruction in instructions in here yeah so we need to calculate pca p alkaline and also total solids yeah so for the pca we can actually locate the ppm values for the ca as calcium carbonate on the ppm scale which is in the y axis yeah so, but before that, we need to forget to change the temperature to Fahrenheit, yeah, because I think here using a Fahrenheit. So, what is the? Can you help me? What is the conversions from eighty-two degrees C to Fahrenheit? What is the temperature? Is it one one eighty? One eighty, I think. Is it correct? 180 degree Fahrenheit. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. So first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the PCA. Yeah? So we can uh, locate the CA. So the CA concentration is 150 ppm. Yeah. So then we can just approximate. This is 100. This is 200, yeah. So we have 20, 120, 40, 60. Yeah, I think around here, yeah, in between this line. 
150 yeah and we need to proceed horizontally to the left diagonal line down to the pca scale where is the pca scale pca scale is this diagonal line yeah so this is the diagonal line so you can just take the horizontal line until this yeah and you can just extrapolate it to the x axis yeah until it's intersected to here yeah okay so we will get the values of pca so we can just assume yeah 2.5 so this is 0 0.5 then 1 2 6 7 8 yeah 2.8 maybe yeah. so you can use your ruler yeah, in order to get yeah more uh, uh, accurate accurate values yeah so this one i just i just uh, try to approximate the values okay once we calculate the pca we calculate the p alkaline yeah so locate the ppm values for the uh, concentrations of the alkaline as the calcium carbonate yeah so we have actually this yeah 34 ppm yeah so 34 should be 35 eh this is 540 yeah i think one line is five the unit so i think around here yeah 34 so we can just uh, proceed horizontally to the to the left i think to the left diagonal line down to the pl scale yeah so this is the line for the p alkaline yeah so we can just take the horizontal line until this and then you can just go here yeah so it's about 3.1 maybe yeah around 3.1 Okay, so we get P alkaline, PCA, and the next one we need to calculate the C scale, yeah, or from the total solids, yeah, from the TDS data. So we have TDS data of 320 ppm, yeah, and uh, yeah, we locate that values, yeah, 320 ppm is around 50, 40. Here, yeah, 320 ppm. Yeah, around here lah. and then proceed horizontally to the proper temperature line so you need to consider this values yeah now yeah 180 degree fahrenheit again don't forget to uh, uh, convert the units yeah to fahrenheit if in the problems stated in the celsius or kelvin okay okay 320 ppm and we have this one yeah the line of 180 degree yeah okay so you can just extrapolate the line horizontally until it's intersected with the 180 degrees line. And then you can just take this up to the C scale. Yeah. So we will have 2, 4, 6, yeah, 1.28 maybe. Yeah. Is it correct? Yeah. So this is the C, yeah. 1.28. Okay. Okay, so uh, then we will have the summations yeah, of this. Yeah? So we can just make a summations of this as a PHS. Yeah? So from the calculation formula previously, so the PHS is actually based on this uh, LSI chart. We can just uh, summations of these three parameters. Yeah? And we will get how much? 9, 8, 9, 11, 3, 6, 7. Yeah. 7.18 yeah then we can calculate the lsi ph actual minus phs 7.5 yeah the ph actual is 7.5 minus 7.18 so we will get 0 0.32 is it yes yeah so it's actually almost similar with the calculations results yeah so around 0 0.3 Okay, yeah. Okay, so you can try for the calculations for 25 degrees in your at your home, yeah. And please clarify whether this result is correct or not. Any questions for this uh, LSI calculations? Is it clear? It's clear, sir. Okay. So how about other students? Clear? Clear, sir. Okay. Clear, sir. Okay, thanks.
Okay, so going to maybe this is the last slide, yeah, uh, because it's already 4:50, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, this is the classifications of the LSI values, yeah, and also the indications, the 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 corresponding indications, yeah, based on the LSI values. This is for the falling and also corrosion uh, trade-off, yeah. So uh, yeah. The balance between this characteristic is actually measured by the LSI. So the generally accepted good range of the LSI is plus minus 0 0.5, yeah? So uh, plus 0 0.5 of, or minus 0 0.5. So in the range of this, yeah, 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5, yeah? This is actually uh, generally accepted as a good range of LSI, yeah? So. In here, there's indications, yeah? so you can read through it. LSI lower than zero. So it is actually indicated that the water is undersaturated with respect to the calcium carbonate. Yeah? Uh, and undersaturated water has a tendency to remove existing calcium carbonate protective coatings in departments and equipments. While for the LSI equals to zero, it means that the water is considered to be neutral, yeah? neither scale forming nor scale removing. For the LSI higher than zero, water is actually super saturated yeah, with respect to the calcium carbonate and scale forming may be occurred. Okay? While for the indications for the corrosions, we can uh, we have the five classifications in here. Yeah? So if the values in between uh, minus two until minus 0 0.5, then the, it will classify as the serious corrosions. If in between zero until minus 0 0.5, slightly corrosions, but non-scale for me. If the LSI equals to zero, balance, yeah? So it means that uh, there is no corrosion and scaling, but pitting corrosion is still possible to be occurred. And zero until 0 0.5, slightly scale forming and corrosive, while from 0 0.5 until two, scale forming, but non-corrosive, okay? So uh, uh, this is the, the general, Classifications, yeah. So if you have positive LSI, tends to form scales. If you have negative LSI, tends to make a corrosions. Yeah. So generally, LSI taken a bit negative values. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, that's it for today. Is there any questions from the students, or maybe any additional message on information from Pak Wawan? Okay, Pak Hendra, thank you so much for giving us the lecture today. Uh, yeah, is Pak. my voice uh, clear? Yeah, Pak, clear, Pak. Okay, uh, because I experienced so many problems with my uh, Zoom. Yeah, okay, I think uh, if you go to the last slide that has been presented by Pak Hendra, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah as, as, uh, I think I have explained before that there will be a trade-off between uh, corrosion and scaling like mm -hmm. if you want to uh, eliminate corrosion then you have bigger uh, possibility of scaling and vice versa mm -hmm. so uh, there will be any pro uh, yeah pasti akan ada masalah ya either itu korosi atau scaling so the solution will be this one like in calculation then the LSI should be taken uh, in the middle but there will be still possible of pitting corrosion I think Later, uh, next week, when I explain about the biofouling and related the uh, microbial corrosion, I will explain a bit about the spitting corrosion, but take it as a slightly negative value. Mm -hmm. So avoid the scale, but still with a bit possibility of uh, corrosion. Yeah, because the, the effect and the duration when the corrosion happen is much, uh, the effect, I think, yeah, uh, if you have serious corrosion, of course, the effect will be uh, very very serious but uh, in terms of duration when the corrosion happen and duration when scaling happen i think scaling is much more uh, faster yeah. yeah that's the the i think that's why we, why we we want to have the lsi index a, a bit negative okay uh, i'll stop the recording first